First, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this uh, interesting conference. I think uh, yesterday and today we have uh, dealt with many interesting subjects. And then I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation uh, entitled, as you can see, Is There a Future for Transplantation as We Know It Today? And those of you who would like to communicate with me can send me an email. Next slide, please. Uh, now the first question arises, of course, uh, transplantation as we know it today. What exactly is that? Next slide. Um, transplantation today is uh, resulting from 40, close to 50 years of experience of some of the people in the audience. And uh, I will talk about transplantation in the future as judged from current trends. Um, next slide, please. The future is here of the triumphant uh, title of the uh, Transplantation Proceedings Abstract Book from a uh, conference. And uh, I think the future is here and it's moving rapidly. Next slide, please. Um, when you have a presentation with a, a question mark, uh, of course you pose several questions and, and there will be several questions that will not be answered. Uh, is it a rhetorical question? Uh, is the presenter going to try to answer that some of the questions in the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, most often the answer is uh, both yes and no. And you can have some people review or comment on your presentation and answer some of the questions. Um, a few years ago I gave a presentation here in Warsaw and it was entitled Transplantation 30 Years. Where do we go from here? And at that time I think I was a little bit more optimistic than I am today. Because at that time, and the subtitle, no, stop, the, this, one, one back. Um, the subtitle of that presentation was, that depends on where we want to go. And now I have a feeling that maybe we are moving in a direction where not all of us would like to go. So I, I think it's uh, uh, outside of our control. Next slide. Uh, we all know that uh, transplantation is the victim of its own success. It's been said repeatedly, and I can say it again. As a consequence of widening acceptance criteria, ever more patients are accepted for organ transplantation, and ever more patients desperately want to have a transplantation, regardless, actually, of all the uh, side effects and the dangers that are inherent in the procedure. Next slide. Uh, we see this one repeatedly, and I borrowed the slide from Howard Nathan of uh, Philadelphia. It shows the uh, waiting list uh, in August of 2002 in the United States, and it looks similar all over the world. Um, one could very well question whether all the patients on the waiting list are available for transplantation. And that it has been said here that um, Patients who have been on the waiting list for some time need to be re-evaluated whether they are still candidates for transplantation. So it has also been said that by opponents that, uh, okay, the transplantologists construct their own waiting lists to show the great demand and to, to show how important their business is. I don't really agree with that, but I think that the waiting lists are maybe not as big as they are depicted to be. Next slide, please. I'm sure the waiting lists will increase because uh, we accept also today high-risk patients. Uh, we accept uh, patients for transplantation with new indications. I've mentioned only a few. In the last few years, patients with hepatitis C, uh, cirrhosis have been accepted, and uh, only lately also HIV-positive patients because HIV is no longer a killing disease with the medication you can give, you can have a long life expectancy. And uh, we will certainly face a number of transplantations, uh, so-called retransplantations, as previous grafts fail. What is transplantation today? I will deal with some of the issues you see here. First and second generation transplantologists are still with us. Uh, organ transplantations and in indications for transplantation. I will speak about living donors and deceased donor or cadaveric donors. I, will, I was prepared to add one more subject to the list, uh, but I'm glad I uh, deleted that because it has been dealt with uh, in the morning when we spoke about uh, clinical trials and the role of the industry 
Uh, I think that in the past the industry was maybe not as uh, uh, active as they are today and they are certainly leading uh, the development. In the past the transplantologists were doing that. Um, now let me turn to the first and second generation transplantologists are still here. I spoke to, um, to a colleague the other day and he said we had a multi-organ multi donor and we had to transplant all the organs. I had problems in finding colleagues in my department to do all the transplantations. And I don't think that would have happened in the past because everyone would have volunteered. They wanted to be part of it. They wanted to be there. Uh, times are changing. I know there is uh, some uh, difficulties in recruiting new transplantologists. And now I'll go to the first and second generation transplantologists, and some of them are here. Uh, I couldn't mention all of them, but Sir Roy certainly is one of them. Uh, I'd like to mention Joe Murray, not only because he got the Nobel Prize, but he was also at the presentation recently giving credit to Francis Moore who was a giant in the field of transplantation and who was uh, the head of the department when all this took place and when you were there, Saroy, in uh, Boston. Tom Stargell and uh, others are, of course, very important. And uh, for those of you who would like to see more of the first and second generation transplantologists, uh, read this book, 30 Recollections. There are 35 more. To illustrate the fact that the first and second generation transplantologists are still with us. Uh, these are the Medawar Prize winners that were awarded at the recent Congress in Miami. And they were all uh, men in their early 90s. And it's impressive that uh, they are still around and, and some of them are very active. But of course it raises the question, uh, hasn't anything happened since that needs to be uh, awarded or, or condemned? Uh, given a reward. I think there are. Now I'll turn to my subject uh, about the donors. Uh, and I like to uh, use the French Spanish word, sin donantes no hay trasplantes. And I had a slide which I couldn't uh, get from the old paper copy to the computer because it didn't show. But we had uh, at one time um, quite a few uh, fellows in our department at Hurringer Hospital and I asked them to write this sentence in their own language. And there was a poll, there were people from India, from China, and from all over the world, uh, because this is true all over the world. Without donors, there are no transplants. Next slide. And I've borrowed that one from Howard Nathan. You can see that down in the, in the corner. And it shows the number of uh, donors in, in, uh, in the various countries. I'll come back to that later. Uh, this was just to move on to a next topic. I'll speak about donors of organs, uh, living donors, and deceased or cadaveric donors, the heart-beating donors and the non-heart-beating donors. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> it's been discussed uh, a lot in detail about the living donors of today, and we certainly accept genetically related donors, sibs, parents, children, grandparents, cousins, more distantly related donors, but I understand that some programs accept only third generation, uh, third degree relatives. And we've had some proposals from patients in Sweden coming with more distantly related donors where we would actually question whether they were related or not. And, and they said, uh, well, in my country we are related. And those were very distantly related. Next slide. Emotionally related donors have entered the field, husbands and wives, crossover transplantations, what's been called fred swaps, friends, unknown donors and non-directed donation, we know that this is, uh, there are programs for this in uh, the United States. And as I mentioned when I read the Dr. Dar's uh, presentation, paid donors do exist. Next slide. Uh, so what organs do the, kid the living donors donate? Well, kidneys, we accept that uh, uh, without any problems. Uh, the pancreases, livers, we have dealt with that. Lungs. Nothing has been said about that, but uh, usually or sometimes the recipient will need two living donors and maybe even a backup living donor if one of the grafts wouldn't do. And uh, of course we have the bowel, small bowel transplantation with living donors. Next slide. A quote from uh, uh, the sounding board in New England Journal of Medicine. Until now organ donation has relied on 
on the voluntarism and altruism of uncompensated living donors. Next slide. There are unrelated living donor programs. We were told that at the satellite uh, meeting in Miami, where the title was uh, Expanding the Living Donor Pool. And uh, there are programs to break the ABO barrier, uh, where there is uh, blood group incompatibility. Uh, there are programs trying to uh, overcome donor recipient incompatibilities by uh, plasma freezes and other programs. And there are uh, programs for no, uh, non directed donation. Um, there was also a panel discussion. Uh, is it desirable to legitimize paid living donor kidney programs? And there was a, a, an interesting presentation, the, the pro and con discussion. Next slide. The pro was uh, Janet Redcliffe Richards. And uh, I think it's difficult to uh, be in this debate because they are uh, using their own, the arguments of the opponent and refuting them. So uh, Radcliffe Richards would mostly say that uh, I don't think that the counter arguments against paid donors are valid. Uh, and the counter arguments are, of course, that the uh, poor will be exploited, nephrectomy is too risky, and organ donation is unacceptable unless altruistic. And of course, we do a lot of living donor transplantation, so we would not uh, uh, pay tribute to the fact that uh, nephrectomy is too risky. Um, and Radcliffe Richards uh, finalized by saying, if we are to justify persisting with prohibition, we need to be sure that the reasons we give are more than just a smokescreen for squeamish self-interest. It's a nice use of words, I think. The author Kaplan, he used some other words, and I'm not going to read all of them, but uh, in summary he says uh, um, it's the uh, arguments against is, is based on the predicted outcomes. Markets will not achieve what proponents seek and will cause problems with unequal access that will only worsen the current situation. But I think there are programs around, which I mentioned yesterday when I read Dr. Dar's paper, that can overcome some of the problems. On the other hand, uh, Peter Neuhaus, where are you? One of your colleagues uh, in Germany said that uh, we have to review the Transplant Act in Germany, which we, you had been working hard for many years to, to get, and now you, you're not satisfied. And uh, he suggested that, uh, it was Chris Brölch, you know that, and he suggested that the donors should be paid or rewarded. And uh, this is the title in one of the German papers, Das Gesetz muss reanimiert werden. And uh, the question is whether you can change the law. Living donors in the future. I'm just quoting from uh, Friedlander in the recent uh, Lancet paper. Um, and he was a very, very strong opponent to paid living donors. Uh, but then he noticed that some of his patients had been abroad to buy kidneys, and, and he changed his mind. And he, the, what he said in the paper is that paid donors are recruited locally. The transactions now receive semi-official recognition from the Israeli ministry. The transplants are generally successful and the medical care seems to meet international standards. 25% um, of the current kidney transplants of patients have bought kidneys abroad from unrelated living donors. So this actually exists. Is this something we will accept? Next slide. Uh, I'll move to the uh, cadaveric donors or the deceased donors. And of course, uh, the dead donor rule says that you are not a donor unless you are dead. And donations should not at all be considered prior to your death. Um, considering the uh, evolution that's going on uh, that I will mention in my next few slides, uh, the question is, uh, is it time to reconsider uh, the dead donor rule? Could you possibly uh, make preparations? Could you possibly identify a donor or a potential donor even before that patient is dead? in order not to uh, uh, damage any of the organs that could be used for transplantation, uh, uh, according to the will of the patient, who might have told a donor registry or his relatives that he wanted to be a donor. Now, the uh, number of cadaveric donors will decrease in the future. I think that's a trend that we have to accept. Uh, we would all be... Uh, careful with our own lives. I never go by bicycle without a helmet. Uh, I always buckle up. I'm sure that everyone is very uh, considerate about the kind of car they buy. It should be a safe car. Uh, that's very good. 
and uh, the good news are also that uh, treatment results are good when it comes to trauma and to intracerebral bleedings. Uh, my next two slides will deal with the uh, results of uh, 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 and the mortality in subarachnoid bleedings. And uh, in the 1950s, it was 60%. In the 1980s, it was uh, 20%. And now, thanks to endovascular procedures, it's down to uh, 10% in good centers. And it's not only that the patients survive, but they survive with good quality of life. And those were our donors. I was still uh, myself a neurosurgeon in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and I know what happened. Next slide. Um, the treatment results are all, also better with, uh, with uh, severe brain trauma. And I think some of the uh, protocols that we have in Sweden have been leading when it comes to good treatment results. And as you can see, the uh, uh, mortality uh, was in the range of the 1950s only 10 years ago, and it's now down to 10 to 15 percent. So the number of donors will certainly decrease. Next slide. Um, there are some uh, neutral or bad uh, elements in this uh, decrease in the number of uh, potential donors. Uh, with uh, advanced diagnosis, I think that patients with uh, severe headache, they always have a CT scan very early. And sometimes the, the diagnosis as well as the prognosis is set very early. And we all know that when you had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you are uh, more ill in the beginning when the trauma hits you and then you recover a little bit uh, with good treatment. Uh, so my question is, is the diagnosis always correct and is the prognosis always correct? Can some of these patients be treated and can they survive? Um, I, I've been told by colleagues that sometimes the diagnosis might not have been that well uh, uh, diagnosed. <clears throat> this also re uh, results in the fact that treatment is withheld or withdrawn when not considered beneficial for the patient. So patients who could probably survive may be not even treated. Um, and this may be due to the lack of intensive care beds, uh, which is definitely one of the bad uh, elements in the lack of donors. And uh, of course, uh, thanks to good health care, very many people survive and, and uh, die in high age. And even if we accept elderly donors, they, some of them might, might have suboptimal organs. Now, it's been discussed also whether we should return to the non-heart-beating donors. And I think there is a resource that can be uh, tapped a little bit be better than we have been doing in the past. It has to do, of course, with kidneys, and we have uh, programs for that. It's been, it was the rule only uh, 20, 30 years ago that the kidney donors were non-heart-beating donors. We can procure livers. There are programs in very many countries. Uh, it's not very much known that uh, lungs can be procured from non-heart-beating donors. Uh, the first one was made in Sweden, and um, I was invited to give a comment on that, and I said, uh, this reminds me of the uh, Bannister, Roger Bannister, the uh, English mile. Once he had done it, very many would do. And uh, I'm sorry to say this hasn't materialized. I know that the group in Sweden have uh, evaluated several non-heart-beating lung donors, and they can evaluate them properly and even make sure that the, the lungs will work. They have evaluated some, found that uh, there were some contraindications. But I think there is a, maybe some kind of a, a a resistance to this procedure in the medical profession. But this is a possibility. Next slide. Uh, some information from Howard Nathan, you know, maybe you already know that 10% that of the donors of, are non-heart beating donors in the most active uh, programs in the United States. But on the other end, only 30 programs have non-heart beating donor programs. Next slide. Current trends. Um, the uh, words you see here on the first line are all the same. They are extended or suboptimal, uh, whatever. Uh, the question is, how can you uh, expand the donor pool? And is there today anything like an ideal donor? And how is an ideal donor? When it comes to the suboptimal donors, we have to ask ourselves the question, how far can we go? Who pays the price? Giuseppe Joveras, uh, had some interesting information about the suboptimal donors. 
And uh, I would like to pose the question. You see there are many more question marks. One of the question marks is, uh, should we give informed consent uh, to the recipients? Should they know? Should they accept? Uh, yes, I would like to have a, a kidney from a suboptimal donor, or is that a professional obligation to, to match the, the uh, donor with the recipient? We have the old for old program in neurotransplant, etc. The dead donor rule, I mentioned that already. Is it time to reconsider? Uh, is brain stem death preferable to total cerebral infarction? Um, I think it is actually. Uh, are the confirmatory tests uh, too sensitive? Uh, something that you might not even uh, breathe about, whether the confirmatory tests are too sensitive. But we have seen sometimes that uh, you have done, done all the clinical tests uh, according to the book. And when you have to do a cerebral angiogram, there is a streak of uh, contrast intracerebrally, which of course doesn't mean that the patient is alive, but uh, it uh, does not uh, agree with the, with the confirmatory test that sh shall show no intracerebral circulation. Um, and also when we consider the, uh, or reconsider the dead donor rule, uh, I pose the question, is there a place for the exit of protocol of elective ventilation uh, for patients uh, ventilated not for their own good uh, but to, to make uh, organ procurement an option. Now I'd like to turn to the consent issues. Consent to cadaveric organ donation. We have in essence two different systems in the world. It's an opting in or an opting out system. I like this pendulum because I think it's swinging from one point to the other and it's only in, the, in Japan that you have active donation and you have to have a written consent from the donor. Um, most countries uh, have presumed consent, next slide, and very many are happy with the opting out system, the presumed consent, uh, the case for presumed consent in organ donation and presumed consent, the solution to the shortage. Next slide. Um, I would like to question whether there is something beyond presumed consent and that would be uh, professionals decide on uh, donation. And uh, next slide. Um, I think there might be a limit to the autonomy of the individual. Next slide. Um, I'd come back to the uh, teachings of Francis Moore. Um, would our society accept some sort of statutory ownership of these organs from a dead donor being transferred from the family to some social agency such as city, town, country or state? That might be achievable but would seem to be difficult. But on death, the custody of these organs should be considered as being transferred to the local organ bank automatically. And that is something that was brought up again in Miami by Henri Cress, who said that maybe society should appropriate cadaveric organs. Be it presumed consent or presumed consent, when it comes to the donor, whether there will be a donor or not, it has to do with the hospital staff and then it's uh, assume nothing because they might not be as favorable to organ and tissue donation as you believe. The Spanish model certainly shows what you can achieve. I pay tribute to Rafael Matesanz and to Blanca Miranda in spite of the fact that I think that the Spanish model is maybe not Spanish from the beginning but originated in Catalonia. Uh, maximizing donation is also an, an initiative uh, showing that you have to appoint someone to be responsible for organ and tissue donation and to make that person accountable. I'll come back to the, the continuation of the uh, quote that I had. I started, stopped here, compensated living donors and of uncompensated family members of cadaveric donors. I'm sorry, I will be done in, in a few, few minutes. Um, next slide. The donor incentives, are they worth a try? Next slide. Uh, once again, the uh, uh, personal communication by Howard Nathan, who said that there was a pilot admitted in, uh, uh, accepted in '94, and uh, uh, it's not what we wanted, but it's in place now, 2002, and almost no one has usually used uh, the uh, $300 you can get. Next slide. Starting with 3,000, it's now um, 300. And the uh, voices in the uh, opposition has been heard. Questions have been raised over whether tying money to donation is ethical. It won't achieve what we wanted it to achieve, says Howard Nathan. And the meal lodging benefit is an insult to donor families. Next slide, please.
So I think there should be both ethical incentives and maybe payment, but more importantly, better organization of procurement. So is there a future for transportation as we know it today? Of course, the answer is yes and no. We are constantly changing. I have outlined some of the changes that I think that we will see in the future. Some of us will uh, welcome the changes, some of us will try to uh, uh, stop some of the innovations. Uh, but more importantly, and I will, someone is giving my slides in a rapid fashion, so this is good. Uh, I will uh, put some of the questions. Uh, uh, is there a future for xenotransplantation and stem cell transplantation in the future? And uh, when is that future, Sir Roy and Ellen Hodges? Is that future here now, or when is it going to happen? Thank you.